Good evening. I now call to order the meeting of the Board of Education of Baltimore County for March 10th, 2020. I invite you to rise and recite the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag to be led by our own student member of the board, Mr. Omar Rashid. We will then remain standing for a moment of silence to remember those that have served Baltimore County public education. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. <coughs> the first item for consideration is uh, consideration of the March 10, 2020 agenda. Dr. Williams, do you have any additions or changes to tonight's agenda? Oh, go ahead. Dr. Williams. There are no changes or additions at this time. Board members. Yes, I would like to add to the agenda board member comments. Um, I see it was taken out. Is there a second? Sorry. Is there any discussion? I just want to point out that in the board officers and Dr. Williams uh, made that arrangement given that we've had many, many uh, extra hours at these meetings and we want to be mindful of staff <laughs> Uh, their time and the board members' time. So, is there any yes. other comments? Um, yeah, I, I think it's important we don't, with the other board, well, let me rephrase it. The other meeting that we have in this month just has committee updates, and in April we only have one board meeting. It's important for our constituents and our community to hear our voices because representation matters. I know a lot of people look forward to hearing what Ms. Pestor, Ms. Scott, and I have to say as three minority women on the board. So, you know, I think I keep it pretty low, about one or two minutes. Thank you. Any other discussion? All in favor, please raise your hand. <laughs> the motion carries unanimously. Ms. Hen. Yes. I move to add the resolution on COVID-19. Is there a second? Any discussion? Ms. Hen? Um, I'd like the board's consideration of a resolution um, regarding board operations in response to the declaration of the state emergency and existence of the catastrophic health emergency regarding COVID-19 declared on March 5th, 2020 um, regarding the outbreak of disease caused by the novel coronavirus. Any other discussion? All in favor, please raise your hand. Any opposed? Abstained? The motion carries. Any other? In accordance with board policy 8314, there needed to be a majority vote of the board to add or remove an item from the agenda. So the meeting, the, <clears throat> the meeting agenda is revised as approved. Earlier this evening, the board met in closed session pursuant to Opens Meetings Act for the following reasons. To one, discuss the appointment, employment, assignment, promotion, discipline, demotion, compensation, removal, resignation, or performance evaluation of appointees, employees, or officials over whom it has jurisdiction. 
or any other personnel matter that affects one or more specific individuals, and seven, consult with counsel to obtain legal advice, and nine, conduct collective bargaining negotiations or consider matters that relate to the negotiations. The minutes of the closed session and our informational summary can be found on our website at www.bcps.org slash board slash informational dash summaries dot html. The next item on the agenda is selection of speakers. Sign-up cards were available to the public prior to the meeting for anyone wishing to speak at this evening's meeting. Board practice limits to 10 the number of speakers at a regularly scheduled board meeting. Each speaker is allowed three minutes to address the board. The completed sign-up cards for this evening have been placed in this box. And the first 10 drawn will be our speakers for tonight during the public comment portion, which comes later in the meeting. Our first speaker for tonight is Dr. Bosch Ferrone. Our second speaker is Laura Juliaris. Our third speaker is Sarah Lewis. Our fourth speaker is Jennifer Weaver. Our fifth speaker is Sashin Habar. Our sixth speaker is Colleen Carr. <coughs> Our seventh speaker is Sharon Saroff. <coughs> Our eighth speaker is Jesse Yeager. And our final speaker is Ellis Barksdale. Thank you. I now call on Ms. Lowry for item E, new business personnel matters. Good evening. Good evening, Chairwoman Causey, Vice Chairwoman Hen, Superintendent Williams, and members of the board. I would like the board's consent for the following personnel matters, retirements, resignations, leaves, ethics review panel member appointment, and certificated appointments. Do I have a motion to accept the personnel matters as presented in exhibits E1 through E5? Thank you, Mr. McMillian. Do I have a second? Thank you, Mr. Offerman. Is there any discussion? All in favor, please raise your hand. The motion carries. Thank you, Ms. Lowry. The next item on the agenda is administrative appointments, and for that we call on Dr. Williams. Madam Chair and members of the board, I would like to bring forward for your approval the following administrative appointment, Supervisor Mental Health Services in the Division of School Climate and Safety. Do I have a motion to approve the administrative appointments as presented in Exhibit F1? Thank you, Ms. Mack. Do I have a second? Thank you, Ms. Hen. Is there any discussion? All in favor, please raise your hand. The motion carries unanimously. Our candidate is Ms. Courtney Blair. Please stand. As the Supervisor of Mental Health Services in the Office of School Climate, she brings to us 6.3 years in Baltimore County. Previously, she worked as a school uh, social worker in Sparrows Point High School and Northwood Elementary School, and previously she worked at the New Pathways Independent Living Program. Supporting her tonight, we ask that her sister stand, Stacy Turney. Congratulations. Our next item is public comment. This is one of the opportunities the board provides to hear the views and receive the advice of community members. The members of the board appreciate hearing from interested citizens. As appropriate, we will refer your concerns to the superintendent for follow-up by his staff. While we encourage public input on policy, programs, and practices within the purview of this board and this school system, this is not the proper forum to address specific student or employee matters or to comment on matters that do not relate to public education in Baltimore County. We encourage everyone to utilize existing dispute resolution processes as appropriate. I remind everyone that inappropriate personal remarks or other behavior that disrupts or interferes with the conduct of this meeting are out of order. I ask you to observe the three minute clock, which will let you know when your time is up. Please conclude your remarks when you see that time has expired. 
The microphone will be turned off at the end of your time, and it could be turned off if a speaker addresses specific student or employee matters or is commenting on matters not related to public education in Baltimore County. If not selected, the public may submit their comments to the board members in hard copy through our staff or via email to boe at bcps.org. I now call on our stakeholder groups to speak, and we have Baltimore County Student Council, Superintendent Student Advisory Council, Ashley Kane. Good evening and welcome. Good evening, Chairman McCausey, Smob Omar, Superintendent Dr. Williams, and the members of the Board of Education. My name is Ashley Kane here on behalf of Angela Chin, the President of Baltimore County Student Councils. I'd like to take this time to update you on the upcoming activities in BCSC. As we've discussed previously, BCSC is hosting the upcoming Maryland Student Council Convention in Ocean City. This event will be held in two weeks and is a great opportunity for students across the state to come together and learn about leadership and elect next year's student representatives on the MASC. Addition, in addition, BCSC is organizing its March General Assembly, which will be held next week. The focus of this assembly will be to raise the environmental awareness and sustainability that BCSE has been working towards all year. Students will have the opportunity to learn about recycling as well as environmental legislation and advocacy. Along with the General Assembly, BCSE is working towards environmental awareness by organizing activities for Earth Day. Finally, I'd like to acknowledge that Thursday will be the day that students have a chance to vote for the next student member of the board. We encourage all students to take the opportunity to educate themselves on the candidates and choose who will be their next representative on the board. Thank you for your time. Our next public comment speaker is Dr. Bosch Ferron. Good evening and welcome. Thank you. Good evening to all. Fear of Corona is overblown. Fear of the unknown is fearful. And of course, fear can hurt, can crash markets as we've seen. But we as a community, as a society, don't seem to have fear that 40,000 Americans die every year from gun violence. And we don't have fear that obesity kills so many people because obesity leads to disease. So what's the solution for that? My solution is what I presented to you last time. Syntax, raise the taxes on alcohol, drugs, french fries, super-sized Coke, chocolate. Okay, I know I'm stressing my, my point, all right? You save lives because if the price is higher, you make more money that comes to the school system, and people will use it less. And if people are skinnier, don't use alcohol and cigarettes, then there would be less use of health care. Another fear is the fear of others. I missed one meeting in January, and I was watching all of you on the live stream. And here is all of a sudden when Dr. Williams was announcing the administrative appointment, he mentioned a name that's a little bit familiar to me. It's kind of like an Arabic name. And here the person had a skull cap that looks like a Muslim skull cap. And he had a little beard that looks like a Muslim beard. So sitting here for 20 years, this is the first middle administrative appointment I have seen in the school system that appears to be Muslim by appearance and by attire and beard. And it really hit me, you know, why one in 20 years? I think that we need diversity, and I would really thank all of you, and especially the HR staff, for appointing a first Muslim American to that position. 
I take this opportunity to ask you, Dr. Williams and other staff, to incorporate the two books I talked to you about. One is Omar Ibn Said, and the other one is The Slave, The Prince uh, Among Slaves. Two, I believe, they deserve to be in the curriculum. I also ask you for consideration to look at the curriculum and look for any misinformation about Islamic contributions into the Renaissance. I thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker for the evening is Laura Juliaris. Good evening and welcome. As always, I want to sincerely thank you for your service and for doing what's best for our kids. In advance of the decision you have to make tonight on the Pleasant Plains Boundary Study, I'd like to add a few final thoughts to consider. For those of you who weren't at the public hearing at Lock Raven High School, I want to echo many of the Hampton parents' sentiments that Hampton may not be the utopia that Pleasant Plains parents are hoping it will be. During its renovation, the Hampton cafeteria and gym were not expanded, which means, as Delegate Guyton pointed out in her letter to you, that those spaces are still meant to be serving a school with an SRC of 307, not 670. That's a sizable difference. Now, let's sit back for a minute, analyze some of the facts, and ask some tough questions. Why would we leave 59 open seats at a school adjacent to one where there's an overcrowding crisis? Why would we bypass that school to bus kids to yet another school, unnecessarily extending children's travel time? Why would we change boundaries, which historically do not get changed back, and call it a short-term solution? Why can't the answer to help Pleasant Plains truly be a joint effort? The fact that Cramwell Valley is an elementary magnet school is not a good enough answer. Its magnet st status should not take pre precedence over providing valuable open seats to non-magnet students who desperately need them. The answers given from Ms. Byers and the boundary study representatives as to why Cromwell Valley's magnet program is not full are very confusing and incomplete. I have also been told that we are waiting for the magnet program to students to matriculate in, but if a short-term solution is truly what's needed, Cromwell Valley needs to be a part of it, given that there are seats open now. I will not stop asking these questions until I get a satisfactory, sensible answer. If it seems like we are putting a lot of pressure out there to include Cromwell Valley in the discussion, we are. If it seems like we are more than a little frustrated by the fact that they've been shielded from the discussion, we are. There needs to be a community effort to help Pleasant Plains, and Cromwell Valley is part of this community. Again, its magnet status should not protect it from being of assistance. While we're at it, let's look at Stonely and the four other schools that are closer to Pleasant Plains than Hampton. This is a central zone and countywide problem, and in order to fix it, we need all hands on deck and all viable schools considered. Thank you so much. Thank you. Our next speaker is Sarah Lewis. Good evening and welcome. Good evening and welcome. Uh, coincidental who I'm following up. Um, so my name is Sarah Lewis. I'm the Vice President of the Lutherville Laboratory PTA. Um, I know you've heard from us before, but I'd like to speak again about the challenges that we face this year with the addition of the CELS program and our ongoing needs. Um, I'd hope to have more positive messages to share, but we're still having our general ed teachers and staff spat on by students. The additional staffing that's been provided has not 
adequately met the needs. We still have students who are in general ed who have serious behavior problems that haven't been directed into the sales program. Um, so I would like to just continue talking about what, what, what our needs are. Um, our current capacity is at 395 um, with a total enrollment of C 368. Now that 395 came down by 12 students with the addition of the sales program. This doesn't take into account the fact that we've lost four classrooms and two um, other spaces to accommodate the sales program. That's 24 students currently. We have our kindergartners, our kindergarten classes have 24 students per class. Our first and second grades have closer to 28. Now, how exactly does anyone expect that our students, general ed or sales, will be successful in classes of upward of 20 in second grade? When we have students who are transitioning in for the first time, the goal of the sales program is to integrate these children back into a mainstream classroom. How are they going to be successful in a classroom when there are already 28 children that are struggling to learn? We have our third and fourth grade classes this year finally have appropriate staffings. We haven't gotten any guarantees yet that that will continue. Our LREA and LREB students are continuing to be ignored in the conversations about what our needs are as we continue to focus. The higher need students are getting the priority attention and it's still not working. We have not gotten confirmation about much of anything other than cells will continue. I echo the previous speaker. We were told that the, need, the reason why Lutherville Lab was taking on the cells program was because it could not expand at Cromwell Valley. Well, Cromwell Valley has 59 to 61, those are the numbers I'm seeing, under capacity. Perhaps the solution then in, instead is we have two classrooms at Lutherville Lab and two classrooms go back for cells to Cromwell Valley where they're Part, they were part of the key school community. We can focus our attention on the two classrooms and ensure that they're successful. And then we can also have the capacity for our zone students who, like the students in Pleasant Plains and Hampton, have no place else to go. We do not have the option of sending. Thank you. Our next speaker for the evening is Jennifer Weaver. Good evening and welcome. Good evening. Hi, good evening. My name is Jennifer Weaver and my daughter is a third grader at Pleasant Plains Elementary School. I wanna thank Ms. Hen and Ms. Rowe for coming to our PTA meeting last night and also extend thanks to Mr. McMillian, Ms. Joes and Ms. Causey for visiting our amazing and overcrowded school. My daughter has had an amazing experiences at Pleasant Plains, but I know that the immediate capacity relief that will come from making a boundary change will make such a difference to the quality of the experience that my daughter will have in these final two years of elementary school. This needs to be done. Option B needs to be accepted. My daughter deserves to eat lunch without having anxiety attacks because of the noise and crowds. She and her classmates deserve to attend classes inside a school building without having to walk through stormy weather to get to learning from the learning cottages. And her teachers deserve to have class sizes that don't prevent them from performing, excuse me, forming relationships and differentiating instruction for all of their students. It's unfortunate that this process has to help some kids at the potential detriment to others, but this change also has the potential for kids to be happier and safer. To all the engaged and amazing parents who have shown up during this process and may be watching and listening tonight, I wanna to talk about and acknowledge what is and what is not in the board's control and what that means for us. Hampton is rightly worried that Towson area development will rapidly inflate their population and the board has no control over that. We all need to be active and engaged with the county council and the county executive to prevent that. Pleasant Plains is worried that we'll be overlooked and left off the capital projects list while our population continues to rise. But while the board can put us on any list they want, it's the county and state governments who control the funding for that list. We need to continue our engagement with them and get that process started. The board also has no control over community mobility, no control over birth rates, no control over parents choosing to send their kids to private school, and it has no control over outspoken PTAs advocating for what they think is best for their kids. 
Something that the board does have control over is relieving overcrowding by moving students to a school that has open seats right now. Option B needs to be accepted. If I can paraphrase from my daughter's current favorite movie, Frozen 2, it's the next right step. And then we can get started on the rest of the steps. Thank you for considering option two. Our next speaker for the evening is Mr. Sashin Habar. Good evening and welcome. Madam Chair and uh, members of the Board of uh, Education, thank you very much for giving me this opportunity to speak. So, uh, so I'm Sachin Hibar, and I'm a parent of two BCPS uh, system children. And I'm here today as a member of Baltimore County Pedestrian and Bicycle Advisory Committee. Uh, the Pedestrian and Bicycle Advisory Committee meets four times a year, and it is focused on promoting healthy and alternative uh, and, environmental, and environmentally friendly means of transit. Uh, it, the uh, the uh, committee is also involved in making the streets street safe for pedestrians and cyclists alike. Uh, the most recent governor's highway safety report showed a sharp nationwide increase in pedestrian and bicycle fatalities. We need to make the, make the, the streets safe for people and particularly for children. The Pedestrian and Bi uh, Bicycle Advisory Committee identifies and recommends projects to the planning department, and these projects are then worked on and turned into grant applications for funding. The committee consists of one appointed member from each council manic district, three at-large members, and a member from Baltimore County Police, uh, Planning Department, Board of Parks and Recreation, and yes, BCPS. BCPS seat has been vacant for years now. Uh, the county executive has made funds available uh, during the last budget meeting and uh, uh, up to $1 million. Uh, and uh, it is very important that the BCPS has a seat at the table. It is important that BCPS works with the committee to make, make the streets safe for the kids to walk and bike to school. Uh, I would encourage uh, the school system to contact Sam Sneed, who serves as the lead point person on transportation, and consider appointing a member to the advisory committee. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker for the evening is Ms. Colleen Carr. Good evening and welcome. Good evening. <clears throat> Good evening, Superintendent Williams, Chairwoman Causey, Vice Chair Hen, and members of the board. My name is Colleen Carr, and I'm the proud parent of the second grader and kindergartner at Pleasant Plains that many of you heard from at the Boundary Study hearing in February. I know that tonight you'll be voting on the recommendation of the Boundary Study Committee. I wanted to thank the many board members who took the time to visit our school and see firsthand what it looks like when you cram over 700 kids into a school built for 545 with core spaces that are undersized for that state rated capacity of 545 students. No solution is perfect. We've all heard the phrase, you can't please everyone all the time, and I think that certainly applies here but Pleasant Plains needed relief yesterday. I hope you'll keep this in mind as you vote tonight. A vote for option B means Pleasant Plains will have hopefully less than eight trailers, lunches that don't need to start at 10.30 a.m., and hopefully our two sets of restrooms won't be under quite so much stress. It means that our hallways will be a little bit less crowded. As we've said before, this must be the first step in a long-term plan to address the overcrowding, not just at Pleasant Plains, but in the central area as well. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Our next speaker for the evening is Ms. Sharon Seroff. That needs to go to staff, please. <laughs> um, Thank you. because today is the holiday of Purim. And uh, so in honor of Purim, I have brought some Purim cookies known as hamantash to uh, be shared around to the staff and the board members. Thank you. Um, my name is Sharon Seroff, 
And I have decided in honor of Purim to do something a little bit different today. Um, usually you hear me say what needs to be fixed. Tonight I'm going to give some awards to schools that are doing it right so that they may be examples for other schools in this county. The first award that I'd like to provide is the Great IDEA Award, that's I-D-E-A for the federal law, and that goes to Louise Coakley and the IEP team of Newtown High School in recognition of their being an example of how to run an IEP meeting. If you want to know how to do it, this is where you go. The 2E Twice Exceptional Recognition Award goes to Dana Denby and the IEP team of Lock Raven High School in recognition of their willingness to help IEP and in excuse me, IEP students in AP and GT classes be successful. They understand that TUI exists. The Amazing Communicator Award. And this um, is partially a thank you to Ms. Beyer. Um, this goes out to Kaya Stevens and the IEP team at Reisterstown Elementary School. In recognition for their providing weekly progress emails to parents. The Thinking Out of the Box Award. This one goes to Joshua Connor and the IEP team of Western Technology High School in recognition of their innovative thinking for recognizing IEP needs in students. And it took a lot of innovation and thinking out of the box for this individual who is a first time IEP chair to qualify a student for an IEP. The if at first you don't succeed, try another way goes to Laura Collins Swicky and the IEP team at Lansdowne High School in recognition of their willingness to go the extra mile to resolve IEP issues. And she gen genuinely deserves this award for her tenacity. <coughs> the I Want to Clone You Award goes to Monica Anthony and the IEP of service award to former assistant principal Robin Rubrick and the IEP team of Harford Hills Elementary. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker for the evening is Jesse Yeager. Good evening and welcome. You are all about to make a very difficult decision. I know that some of you have taken this boundary change seriously and have taken what has been said both for and against it into consideration, and I thank you for that. Pleasant Plains is an immediate need and no one disputes that fact. However, I want to take this last chance to implore you to consider Cromwell Valley Elementary as a partner with Hampton to share the burden of this overcrowding issue. Our area simply cannot afford the luxury of a magnet program that is hoarding empty seats when we are facing such a massive overcrowding issue. 
Three new apartment developments and two new single-family neighborhoods are being added to Hampton's catchment. 37 single-family homes are mostly built. 571 apartment units are available for lease right now. These are not conceptual projects. They are nearly done. And now an additional development of 52 units in Hampton's catchment is approved and in the planning phase. That brings us to 623 apartments plus 37 single family homes. Yet somehow we are only supposed to expect 25 students out of all of that in an area touted for our excellent schools. Yes, please send kids from Pleasant Plains to Hampton, but Cromwell Valley must be utilized. And we need a real plan moving forward. Do not think that once you have made your decision tonight that this is over. You already missed a great opportunity in this boundary study for a better and more sustainable solution. We need immediate action to establish a lasting solution. We cannot wait another 10 years. We need this addressed now, not just for Pleasant Plains and Hampton, for our entire county, for our kids. Thank you. Thank you. Our final public speaker for the evening is Ms. Ellis, oh, excuse me, Mr. Ellis Barkdale. Good evening and welcome. Hi, how's everybody? So I'm here again. Now I've been here since I first heard the other speakers, I'll, I'll speak on this. Um, 20 years ago I was here and I don't know if any of you guys were there. Uh, and we fought for a new school for Ramstown Elementary School. And we had a fight through everybody because you do need state money and you do need the council, the city council, I mean the uh, county council. And we forced the issue. So to the speakers who are speaking about Pleasant Plains, I want you to recognize that it's more than just speaking to this board that's going to make it happen. And you have to put pressure to bear everywhere. Because we were told we would not be on the, in the budget. We, would, we were last, or we weren't even in there. We ended up pushing and pushing and pushing and pushing, and then we took out 70% of the third grade class from the MSPAP test, was the state test at that time. And that forced the hand of uh, uh, Miss, uh, who was the state person at that time? Um, forget her name now. Miss Grasmick, right. And so within one hour of school starting on that Monday, she gave a call to our PTA president, uh, which the PTA president gave a call to me. And then we proceeded to have a talk behind closed doors where we talk with Nancy Grasmick, Yale Stensler, and we worked together. And we ended up at least forcing the hand to re receive one more million dollars to a renovated school. Uh, I think Ramblestown Elementary School is still, you know, uh, pretty good on the class size structure. Um, but I can tell you that it takes more than just the Northwest area and then the Central area is now talking about Pleasant Plains. It's going to take working together across those so-called boundaries and you're going to have to use some things that are not normal like just coming here and talking and getting zero response because the last time I was here, I was talking about six is greater than five. And I'm telling you right now, and I can still recognize that you guys still don't think that's true. Um, so I'm offering to speak to anybody from Pleasant Plains if they want to about some other strategies that might be necessary to make things happen. Thank you. Our next item on the agenda is superintendent's report. So good evening, everyone. Uh, late last month, MSDE announced that our four-year cohort graduation rate was at 87.6% for the class of 2019. 
So uh, BCPS continues to outperform the state and our five-year graduation rates improve for students receiving special ed services in English language. Um, although we still have work to do, the additional staffing that I requested in the FY21 operating budget proposal is crucial to supporting student success from the early grades through graduation. Congratulations to Wellwood. Wellwood International School is the first BCPS school to be authorized as an International Baccalaureate World School for the Primary Years Program. Principal O'Neill credits her staff for their collaborative planning and reflection with the school-wide vision, empowering inquiring minds to change the world. I would also like to highlight Omar Rashid, our student member of the board, and Angela Chin, uh, president of the Baltimore County Student Councils. Uh, Omar and Angela have worked together to uh, spearhead our first SMOB election for all secondary students, which will be held on Thursday, as well as advocating for student leaders with the Maryland General Assembly. Our future is indeed bright, thanks to their leadership and all student leaders across the county. All students have until March 20th at 445, 445 to be exact, to submit our original haiku in our Team BCPS Haiku Contest. Our winner will be named at the elementary, middle, and high school levels, each receiving a prize pack. Additional haiku will be selected for a book featuring student artwork. More information is available at www.bcps.org slash haiku contest. If you haven't had a chance to take the stakeholder survey yet, you're still in luck. Uh, the deadline has been extended through tomorrow, March 11th. Results uh, help shape our school progress plans, our funding, and our next str strategic plan. The survey is available for all parents, staff, and community members, as well as students in grades three to 12. We received more than 81,000 responses, but we want to hear from everyone, so please go to bcps.org to take the survey. Finally, BCPS will continue to work to implement public health recommendations and show and share updated information with the community regarding COVID-19. We will continue to have, as cabinet members, daily briefings, ongoing communication with staff from the Baltimore County Department of Health, regular updates uh, to our school nurses, uh, review and reinforce of school cleaning, and regular updates to you, to our principal, staff, parents, and community members. And finally, every board member, every board meeting, I apologize, uh, my first team sits here throughout each meeting, and those those who are supporting central office. So I would like for all central office staff members who are present to please stand at this time. Come on, let's stand, come on. I wanna thank you for your support and your leadership in Baltimore County Public Schools. Thank you very much, that is my report. Thank you and welcome to March. Looking back among many achievements, as Dr. Williams has pointed out, on Monday, March 2nd, Dr. Williams and I attended the Maryland Blue Ribbon Schools Award Banquet to celebrate Jacksonville Elementary School being named one of Maryland's six newest Blue Ribbon Schools. We congratulate, congratulate Principal Deb Miller and her team for being ranked number one in Baltimore County and number one in the state. March 1st through the 7th was National Social Worker Week, and we spent time highlighting those very important individuals. March 2nd was National Read Across America Day, and on March 6th, placements for Magnet High Schools were released. March 8th was International Women's Day with many celebrations. Looking forward, on Wednesday, March 18th, board members will attend the State of the Schools event held at CQ Arena. And March 19th is the official first day of spring. And hopefully we are gonna make it there without another snow day. At the last board meeting, board members voted unanimously in favor of the fiscal year 21 operating budget. This budget reflects a reinvestment in personnel that will help BCPS kickstart its recovery from previous year's investments in machines and not people. We are excited to support the superintendent in this effort and to see the positive impact that this investment in people will have on students' health, safety, 
and academic achievement, which over the last five years has stagnated. The completion of the Baltimore County Public Schools budget process is just one critical step in ensuring that our students have what they need to succeed. All who care about education must advocate for required funding at the county and the state level as well. Tonight, the board votes on the Pleasant Plains Capacity Relief Boundary recommendation. Board members spend many hours outside of board meetings to prepare for actions that we take, and I appreciate the efforts of each and every board member. We engage with the community so that we are ready to evaluate options and make decisions. We listen to speakers at board meetings, we read the emails, and attend PTA meetings. There are bound to be different reactions to any decision made, but be assured that we take the work of the board seriously. In fact, on February 19th of last year, 2019, the board approved the operating budget, which included a request for funding for a 10-year capital plan. The county approved the funding in its own budget, and they are in the process of selecting a firm to conduct the work on long-term solutions for schools' overcrowding and facility conditions. Last but certainly not least, we appreciate Dr. Williams and his team's diligence and proactive engagement as the COVID-19 situation rapidly evolves. Please stay connected to all of the avenues with BCPS to hear the latest updates on the website through phone calls and emails. As always, student and staff, health and safety is our number one priority. Thank you. And next, we have Mr. Omar Rashid for the SMOB report. Good evening. This past week, the Superintendent's Advisory Council met to discuss the grading policies here in BCPS. Right after, we met with Debbie Phillips about the state of the schools happening on the 18th of March at Towson University. March 12th, the Anti-Bullying Task Force will be meeting, and March 19th, BCSC will be hosting their GA with attendees from across the county. The SMOB candidate question and answer videos are now out and available for students to watch and be prepared to vote for their next SMOB on Thursday. I have been doing several school visits and will keep coming to events that students are inviting me to. Up next is Friday Eastern Tech. I want to thank our BCSC officers who are here at every board meeting. Ashley and Matthew, can you please stand? <laughs> Students, stay safe and stay sanitized. As always, free for you to reach out to me with any concerns. Thank you. Thank you. Our next item is item K, new business action taken in closed session. And for that, we call forward Mr. Brusades. Good evening. Good evening. Uh, earlier tonight, the board met in its quasi-judicial capacity to hear an appeal on a confidential student matter. That appeal was heard on the record as there was no timely request for oral argument. At this time, it would be appropriate to confirm the actions taken by the board in closed ses session in that matter, which was hearing examiner number 20-41. Do I have a motion to approve the action taken in closed session? Thank you, Ms. Mack. Is there a second? Thank you, Ms. Rowe. Is there any discussion? All in favor, please raise your hand. The motion carries unanimously. Thank you. Thank you, and the order is on the back table there for signing before you leave. Thank you. Next item is item L, new business contract awards, and for that I call on committee chair, Ms. Hen. Members of the board, the board's building and contracts committee met earlier this evening. Items L1 through L23 are being forwarded to the full board for approval. <coughs> Do I have a motion to approve items L1 through L23? Thank you, Mr. McMillian. No second is needed since the recommendation comes from the committee. Board member, are, is there any discussion? Mr. Kuhn? I just have a question about a lease renewal for the Pulaski Park Suites. Thank you. We have Mr. Dixit and Mr. Saris joining us. Uh, good evening. Thank you. Um, my only question is: This is a 10-year lease term. Is that is that the is that what the previous lease was for? 10 years. The previous lease was 
for five years with an option to renew for another five years. So it was a 10-year lease. So is this a 10-year lease with an option to renew, or is it a five-year lease with a five-year option? I'm just curious. This is a 10-year lease, Straight. and the reasoning for that is that there are improvements that uh, the landlord has agreed to do at no cost to us. And if we do it for less than 10 years, we explored the seven year, five year option, we'll have to pay costs for those improvements. So it is more cost effective to have a 10 year lease. Okay, and and I, I understand we're currently in this space, so moving and, and what have you can be challenging. Did we consider, because it's not clear by what's shared here, do we consider other, other space in other areas or was this just the, the only focus we had? Our process is that whenever we have uh, any lease for renewal, we work for a county approved leasing agent, leasing company, which is what we did at this time. And we looked at other options. There are not too many spaces of that size that are easily available, but we did look at the cost of lease in the surrounding area, and we still did not find anything which was less than that. We looked at the option of building a new building, but there are no uh, funding, there, there are no funds available for that. So with no funds available for a new building and not space available of that size for leasing, uh, we negotiated a price which is the same price <coughs> or less than what we are paying right now. Thank you. I do have one other question about um, this looks like a modification KHS 322-17 and basically Enviro Solutions Incorporated looks like it was bought by Waste Management of Maryland Incorporated. So the question is it only goes through 529-2020 which is in like two or three months, right? This is a consent to assignment if I recall right. So this is just change the name of the company. Right, and and I, I'm I'm fine with that, Mike. My, my question is, this ends, um, and it's not clear to me. It says because construction of the new Northeast Area Elementary School, Package One B Waste Management, is this just to handle the waste from the construction site, and that's that's, that's what correct. this is. That's correct. And this was for when we say new Northeast Area Elementary School, we're talking about Honeygo which is already completed. So this was needed to make some of the final payments to this vendor whose legal name changed since okay, thank the you. original contract I, I was I understand. Bid. Thank you yeah. very much. <coughs> Any other questions? All in favor, please raise your hand. The motion carries unanimously. Thank you. Thank you. The next item on the agenda was added earlier this evening, COVID-19 resolution. And the uh, origination of this resolution is uh, given the fact, and I'll just read from the beginning of it, uh, Whereas Lawrence uh, J. Hogan, Jr., Governor of the State of Maryland, issued a declaration of state of emergency in existence of catastro catastrophic health emergency COVID-19 on March 5, 2020, regarding the outbreak of disease caused by the novel coronavirus. And whereas the United States Centers for Disease Control and Prevention has issued guidance to all states and local governments and all citizens recommending preparedness to prevent community spread and guard against the potential of a COVID-19 pandemic, our board council suggested that the board be prepared to handle meetings in a situation where board members may not be able to attend in person and where they may need to um, attend remotely. And uh, so that is the, what we're gonna discuss at this point. Okay. Madam Chair, would you like me to read the resolution in full at this time? Uh, certainly, is there a motion? Mm -hmm. 
Motion to accept the resolution. Is there a second? Mr. Kuhn, thank you. Ms. Uh, Rowe, would you like to speak to your motion or would you like Ms. Hen to continue in reading it? Ms. Hen would like to continue in reading it. That would be fine. Okay, thank you. Okay. Whereas the Board of Education of Baltimore County deems it essential to prepare for the possibility that due to medical or health emergencies related to COVID-19, individual board members may not be able to attend board meetings or board committee meetings, or the possibility that it may be necessary for the entire board or a board committee to meet remotely or virtually in order to protect the health of the public or board members, and whereas the business of the board must continue even if medical or health emergencies related to COVID-19 arise, and whereas the board recognizes that the Maryland Open Meetings Act requires requires that the board hold its meetings in public unless otherwise permitted under the act. Be it therefore resolved that notwithstanding any other policy of the board, in the event of a health or medical emergency, and until board policy can be amended to provide more specific guidelines, an individual board member hereby is authorized to participate in board meetings or board committee meetings remotely and without being physically present at the meeting, as long as the member is able to listen to and communicate fully with the other members of the meeting. And it is further resolved that notwithstanding any other policy of the board, and until board Board policy can be amended to provide more specific guidelines in the event of a medical or health emergency the board chair in consultation with the vice chair and the superintendent may declare that a board meeting or a board committee meeting be held remotely in its entirety without the physical presence of board members subject to the establishment of a mechanism that would allow each board member the opportunity to fully participate in the meeting despite not being physically present and that would allow the public to also remotely attend those portions of the meeting that are open pursuant to the Maryland Open Meetings Act by being able to listen and or view those portions of the meeting. And it is further resolved that the superintendent is authorized to establish an appropriate technological me mechanism that would allow board members individually or as a whole to fully participate in meetings remotely without being physically present and which would allow the public to attend the meeting by being able to fully listen to those portions of the meeting that are open pursuant to the Maryland Open Meetings Act. Thank you. Board members, questions or comments? Ms. Jose? Thank you. Um, this is for you, Dr. Dr. Williams. Uh, for me, this resolution is not clear in terms of is this just for the COVID-19 or does that uh, also include any other pandemic that might happen? Uh, I think it needs a little bit of clarification on my end. Does that just end with COVID-19? Is it valid for another pandemic situation? Is it valid for just if there's bad weather and we start having these um, meetings online now? So you know, to me, th there is this clarity that's not there. And if you could clarify, thank you. I would also ask Mr. Brusades to come forward to uh, uh, answer He's our board counsel for the evening to answer any legal questions that may arise. Thank you. I, I would just comment the mechanism to provide this alternative is something we really just need some time to explore and to answer your, your point, whether are we dealing specifically with the COVID-19 or other situations. But in terms of the appropriate mechanism to do this, um, that will be the work of, of the staff to figure that out at this time. If I could follow Joe's, up. Joe, sure. So it hasn't been figured out yet. Um, I just need to know if this would kind of be this blanket resolution where we could just have meetings randomly online, everybody Skyping, or uh, it would be just for this situation with COVID-19 or any other pandemic that might arise in the future? I would recommend for emergencies and not to be the fallback for any simple situation. So uh, I think that will be the discussion of the board, but definitely for the staff for us to figure out the mechanism to make this work. And to the board council, um, is there clarity in the language that this will be limited to that, or it seems like it's very open-ended to me? Um. Uh, it, it appears that the intent 
is to have it be limited to the COVID-19 situation, as that is what is discussed in all the whereas clauses, in the actual uh, be it therefore resolved clauses, there appears to be a little bit broader relating to a medical or health emergency. Uh, if you wanted to have it specifically limited to uh, uh, this current health crisis, it could be easily amended to say, in the event of a medical or health emergency related to the COVID-19 issue in the resolved clauses. Okay, thank you. Ms. Hen? Thank you. I was going to refer to the same sentence that Mr. Brusades just did on page two, um, the next to last resolved clause that states in the event of a medical or health emergency, the board chair in consultation with the vice chair and the superintendent may declare that a board meeting or a board committee meeting be held remotely in its entirety. So it does qualify that it's a medical or health emergency, but as Mr. Brusades suggested, if it's the desire of the board to qualify that further, then that could be an amendment that we'd consider. I just need some clarification on that with the health emergency. Is it my health emergency if I have a headache and I, I say I can't come to the meeting? It, it just is not there yet for me. It just seems like it's open-ended with health. It, it could be um, interpreted as a health, emergent, health or medical emergency for a board member that can't make it to the meeting. That appears to be what the first uh, resolved clause deals with is a particular board member or board members that has a, uh, a personal health situation that is precluding them from attending in person. And that could be because maybe they have uh, an illness themselves or maybe they're worried about, uh, uh, they have a, their caregiver for someone who is uh, immunocompromised. Uh, but the second resolved clause, it gives the board the ability to have the, f the whole board uh, have its meeting be done remotely as opposed to having it done like it is now with one or two people calling in. The whole board could hold the meeting remotely. So for me, it's still unclear because I could say I have an emergency, I have a childcare issue, I'm going to make any of the meetings and then just attend all meetings online. So. I'm just not comfortable unless that clarification is provided because it could be up for use and abuse later on. Um, sure, and I think by adding the phrase in the, in the resolved paragraphs, in the event of a medical or health emergency related to COVID-19. Ms. Rowe. So I think that one of the things we're seeing in other countries is that people are unable to circulate not only because they themselves are sick, but because entire areas have been quarantined. And if we're going to say revised language from health or medical emergency related to COVID-19, we should also include that that also includes quarantine. So you may not be sick, but if your household has been quarantined, you can't leave. So if my mother gets sick, my whole house is confined to the house for at least two to six weeks. Okay, Ms. Mack? But if we change the wording to say, be it therefore resolved that notwithstanding any other policy of the board in the event of a medical COVID-19, that would cover the situation that you just outlined. I guess I just need to know if, if this covers, if we say related to COVID-19, if that covers a quarantine as well, or do we need to say quarantine? Because it may not be my personal health emergency. It may be that everyone is quarantined, or I'm quarantined, or my house, or, you know, you could have a whole quorum of the board, each with one family member sick, or one person they've come in contact with who's sick, who's quarantined. So I think we need to express that if you're quarantined, that is defined as a health or medical emergency. So, Ms. Mack, were you uh, proposing an amendment to the resolution? 
Um, yes, because I share the same concerns that Ms. Joes had, that it was as written too broad. And um, I think if we're going to look at changing how board meetings are done in the future, outside of a state of emergency, let's say, that that is work that there's a lot of work that needs to be done around that. Um, I, th I think we need to specify related to COVID-19. And to me, uh, it, in the event of a medical or health emergency covers whatever that is, if it's the board member, the board member's family, quarantine, um, anything that results as from COVID-19. That I mean, that's what I would say. I think if you just want to make a motion to make an amendment, that can be considered. Um, I move that the resolution be updated to um, where, for all of the therefore resolved clauses to include the words related to COVID-19 immediately following the event of a medical or health emergency. Is there a second? It needs a second. Is there additional discussion before we vote on the amendment to this resolution? Ms. Joes? So also the other thing that's not clear is that this, this just relates to board members, but when we have our board meetings, there's a whole lot of staff that helps uh, put this together, Tracy and all of the staff that's sitting here. Does that even apply to them or, or you know, how are they gonna attend this board meeting, which is imperative that they attend. We're not just going to have a 12 of us just talking on the phone. This, this resolution uh, just authorizes the remote participation of individual board members or the board as a whole. It doesn't speak to the issue of staff. That is something that uh, would need to be operationalized, uh, and I believe the superintendent would take the lead on that. Oh, super nice not here. Um, so again, it comes down to that. I think staff has to be included in this because we can't have board meetings without staff also partaking in that pandemic because in the fall, it could be another pandemic that hits us. We don't know. I just think it needs a little bit more clarification, adding staff, and I think the superintendent probably needs to uh, tighten it up a little bit with his... Um, well, the, the, the Open Meetings Act applies specifically to the board and board members and having their deliberations, your deliberations, be in the public, not concerned so much with the how you get to the board meeting by having the staff do, all, do a, a lot of the legwork to, to get you there. But that is certainly something that uh, the superintendent would be doing to operationalize this. Thank you. Ms. Head? Thank you. Sure. Um, in response to Ms. Joseph's comment, the second and third resolved clauses address the role of the superintendent in operationalizing this. Um, the second resolved clause um, requires that the superintendent be consulted when the board chair and vice chair, um, it states in the event of a medical or health emergency, the board chair in consultation with the vice chair and the superintendent may declare that a board meeting or committee meeting be held remotely. The third resolved clause um, authorizes the superintendent to establish the mechanism. So if, if we need to elaborate on the third resolved clause to authorize the superintendent to also um, enable staff, but I, I believe that's a detail that, that may be unnecessary as that's normal protocol for all board meetings. Um, but I believe this, this does cover um, providing the superintendent with the authority to operationalize um, this as, as directed by the board. So this is not in any way circumventing um, current protocol or the superintendent's authority to, to operationalize. Thank you. Board members, other questions? We are missing one board member. Um, if there's no other questions, we can go ahead and take a vote on, the first thing is to vote on the amendment, which, um, Ms. Mack, can you restate that? 
I move that the resolution be updated um, specifically in the therefore resolved sections to add related to COVID-19 immediately following in the event of a medical or health emergency. Thank you. All in favor, please raise your hand. Any opposed? Any abstain? The motion carries. Thank you. The next, uh, now that that amendment is done, does anyone have any other questions or further amendments to the resolution? All in favor, please raise your hand. Any opposed? Any abstain? Thank you. Uh, the motion carries. The next item on the agenda is policies. Second reading. Members of the board, the Policy Review Committee asks that the board accept this report of the committee's recommendation to amend the following board policies. Policy 5510, positive behavior. Policy 5520, student dress code. Policy 5530, student use and possession of tobacco. These recommendations are presented to you on tonight's agenda as Exhibit N. M. Do I have a motion to adopt the recommendation of the board's policy review committee? No second is needed since the recommendation comes from the committee. Is there any discussion? All in favor, please raise your hand. Any opposed? Any abstained? The motion carries. The next item on the agenda is unfinished business, Pleasant Plains Elementary School capacity relief boundary recommendation. <coughs> For that, we have Dr. Monique Wheatley Phillips and Community Superintendent Christina Byers. Good evening and welcome. Good evening. Good evening, Chairwoman Kazi, Vice President. Vice Chair Han, Superintendent William, and members of the board. Tonight we bring forth a request for a decision regarding the option that was recommended by the Pleasant Plains Boundary Study Committee. The recommended option B was voted on by the committee who engaged in a process of data collection, analysis, and community engagement. Throughout the months of study, the committee attended several meetings where they reviewed hundreds of documents, developed and evaluated scenarios, and worked together to build consensus. We thank them for their time and commitment to the process. Engagement with the public was facilitated through the completion of an optional survey, the availability of a dedicated boundary study email, a public information session, and a board hearing meeting. All meetings were live streamed and available for viewing throughout the process. Ms. Myers, community superintendent, and her team have worked proactively to craft preliminary plans in support of the transition so that if approved, there is continuity and coherence for the students and their families. Thank you. Board members, do I have a motion to approve the recommended capacity relief option B for Pleasant Plains Elementary School? So moved. Thank you, Ms. Rose. Is there a second? Second. Thank you, Ms. Hen. Any discussion? Ms. Pasteur? This decision has just taken me to the wall. Um, there are just so many moving pieces to it, but I first want to thank you and the people who were on the committee who um, worked so hard to bring us to this. And I guess it, it has taken me to the wall because I recognize um, having been on past boundary studies myself, just how wrenching the process is for everyone concerned. And I want to thank you, uh, Dr. Wheatley Phillip, for the conversation we have had about this and Dr. Williams um, as well, because certainly this process moves right to the notion that we're going to have to change the process, that we can no longer look at schools in a vacuum, a school in a vacuum individually, that we need to process areas 
communities. And I can speak to District 2 and District 4 because between our two districts, we have 14 schools that are overcrowded. Nine of them are in my district. And of the nine, two of them are above, greatly above, the 115% that the county council at this point, which we are going to work on um, in getting that changed. And so what we do as we look at this has to be more far-reaching. I, I just take this so personally. It has to be more far-reaching um, in, in looking at what is coming down the road. And, and, and I really appreciate the conversation and the forward thinking that you have, um, Dr. Wheatley Phillip, and also taking a look and just knowing, having been an administrator for two magnet schools, principal in one, assistant, assistant principal in two, Carver and Sudbrook, and knowing that whole process, one being full county and the other taken at the beginning you know, the area and then going out and then being in a comprehensive school that had two magnet programs. This is a tough thing and we add magnet programs and I know the process so I, I certainly have a heart to some of the things that we heard but knowing that if you open it up at some point they will come then what do you do because you don't want to keep moving children around. So all of that just because I needed to say that this is bigger than that. This is something that really is systemic and we need to process. And all of the people who talked about Cromwell, understanding or not understanding that once a school has just been through a boundary process, correct, that they are then exempt from another one in the same area, is that correct? I think we In look at not having to move children um, yes. you know, within a certain period um, too often. Yes, and that goes to that whole group thinking. We can't, I don't, I don't see anymore how we get around it, that we have to be looking down the road where our, our schools are concerned. Thank you. So I'm not sure who was first over here, so we can just go Ms. Joes, Mr. McMillian, and Ms. Mack. Thank you. Uh, Mr. McMillian and I had the opportunity to visit Pleasant Plains Elementary, Halstead Academy, and Hampton uh, Elementary School last week to take a look at these schools. And um, you know, thank you to Mrs. Albert, Mrs. Knoll, and Mrs. Kaiser. I saw the discrepancies in resources and facilities across these three schools, overcrowding and antiquated infrastructure. Um, and these are some of our most vulnerable and marginalized children. So I, I, I support the motion, but I was wondering if that the current Pleasant Plain Elementary School resources could be maintained at current levels, even with option B. Um, because they really do need those resources they have. It's a Title I school. and. And I saw single-handedly how, how different that school is from the schools that I, I subsequently visited. So does that, can I make a motion for that? Should I amend the motion? Or uh, is that something I just request to you, Dr. Williams? I, I think just directing the question to Dr. Williams and yeah. let Dr. Williams Dr. answer Williams. it. <laughs> I think that's, we can look at that, uh, Mrs. Byers, in terms of the resources that are currently at. Pleasant Plains. Well, is it possible to maintain the current resources when the overcrowding is relieved so they have those resources for their most vulnerable children? So it is possible, not knowing where we stand with our budget in terms of the approval. So I, I, would, I could say we will explore, um, but there's still some questions around our FY21 budget. Thank you. Mr. McMillian. Oh. Good, evening. Good evening. Please refresh my memory. 
was it Hampstead, Pleasant Plains, and Halstead, were they the only real three options that were given to the committee? Were other options available as far as Stonely, Oakley, those other schools? For this particular study, the three schools that were involved were Pleasant Plains, Hampton, Hampton as well as Halstead. And the reasons around that was really um, connected to the enrollment of the other adjacent schools. When we looked at other schools and we looked at the number of students enrolled in those schools, we selected these, these two schools because of current enrollment. And, and Cromwell Valley was not considered seriously because it's a magnet school and those and it's waiting to fill up with the kids that as they matriculate upward based on the 2015 boundary process for Cromwell when we looked at the number of grade levels as the magnet program grew because we're accepting kindergarten students each year and I think there are approximately 60 there are about 60 68 students that are enrolled in Cromwell each year. And as the magnet program gro um, increases, it grows up each year, each grade level, um, by the fall of this school year, the school will be at or near capacity because the magnet program is expanding and they also have a limited walk area. Uh, I want to thank those three principals also because they took time out of their day to give us the opportunity to walk around those buildings and have conversation. Uh, and Miss Patricia Kaiser, 18 years at Hampton. She's been through four boundary changes. She made it through the 2011-13 construction period, uh, how they shifted people around in that building. Uh, it, it just, that's mind boggling to me. And I'm really happy that she sat in on the construction meetings and made some recommendations to them about some storage space that was gonna be utilized. Um, and I have one other, th in this, this appears to me to be a short-term answer. And the whole, something that was brought up to me in discussion was looking at the old North, excuse me, the old Lock Raven Elementary School as something down the road that might help, you know, if we had a facility study, an analysis of that old building and to look at it and see if that's an option for a long-term uh, consequence to help help solve this you know we're talking short term but I agree with these people you know the short term but if these developments if more kids come in from these developments than we anticipate and that that's shared with us you know are we then again putting another school right on top of you know uh, you know in another situation where they're overcrowded what's the long term you know, process is what I'm curious about. And is Lock Raven Elementary something that we would seriously look at? Thank you. Ms. Mack, we're going through who has not, who has yet to speak and then we'll circle back around. Okay, Ms. Mack and then Ms. Rowe. My comments um, are also almost a mirror of what Ms. Pasteur said. Um, I take notes at every meeting and in preparation for this meeting went back and tallied up um, who spoke in favor of the option B, who spoke against it, went back and read through all my emails and I'm very conflicted. And I will be honest and say one of the things I'm conflicted about is that I, I'm a fan of magnet schools. My kids went to magnet schools, but I think a magnet school in an area where we have such overcrowding in an elementary school is a luxury that we may not be able to afford. Um, that is one concern that I have. Um, I have a question, uh, Mr. McMillian, um, Dr. Lee Phillip asked, asked you about Stonely, Oakley, and Rogers Forge, I think, and you mentioned something about their head count. Can you be more specific about that? Are they, were, the, were their percent head count utilizations higher than Pleasant Plains? Um, At the time of the study? Yes. I, I guess I'm trying to understand more specifically why they were left out of the study. Right. So I have current data in terms of the enrollment of Stonely at this time. So for example, Stonely, the SRC state rated capacity is at 700. The enrollment as of, seven, of September 30th of this school year, 2019, was at 748. And the enrollment as of today is 739. And that's just current data for Stonely as of today. 
I don't have the historical data from 2015, but this is the <coughs> enrollment that we would consider um, for schools that would be included as part of a study. This is the enrollment for Stone Lake. But I thought I heard the speakers tonight. Someone said um, a school with a state rated capacity of 307 now has 650 students. Um, and that Pleasant Plains has a state rated capacity of 545 and has 700 students. So it would seem to me that a school like Stonely, where they were only 448 students over the capacity, would have been included in in at least the relief view of like what how could we provide relief because also let me say I ha have heard the Pleasant Plains parents speak um, saw the pictures of the kids in the hallway I can't imagine and that's why I'm so torn with this but I I just think we I don't think we have the luxury of a short-term solution anymore, um, but I know that Pleasant Plains need relief, needs relief. So I just need to understand how we got here today, and I don't want to revisit the whole boundary study, but it doesn't make sense to me that a school that was only 48 students over the state rate of capacity was not included in a study when a state rated school of a state rated capacity of 307 has 650 kids. I, I just, I don't understand it. So the data that we have that shows the, the official numbers at the start of the study, Hampton Elementary on September 30, 2019 was at 86.42% utilization. Pleasant Plains was at a 124.77 utilization. Halstead was at 98.45 utilization. So the utilization across the three schools was at 102.08%. 102, the numbers that we speak of in terms of Stonely and neighboring schools were much in excess of that. I'll ha I, okay, I'll have to look at the numbers. The math doesn't work for me, but thank you very much, and thank you for your work. Did you want to ask? Uh, um, if, if um, to include Stonely, um, relocatable units, would any students you move there, you would have to add additional relocatable units. The school already has three relocatable units. But aren't we talking uh, about having to put relocatables at Hampton, potentially, no. to accommodate not, them? Not at this time. Okay, no. Based on, based on option, Based on option B, the utilization for Hampton would be at 101.34, Pleasant Plains 106, and Halstead at 98.45. Ms. Mack, are you finished? Okay, Ms. Rowe, we're going to those who have not yet spoken and then we'll circle back to those that have already spoken. So I just wanna, address a little bit of the history that people might not be aware of since this is my neighborhood and I went through living in this neighborhood as all of this unfolded of where we were and how we got to where we are today because I think it will actually answer some questions. Um, Towson area elementary schools had significant amounts of overcrowding and there was not too long ago a significant debate about where to build an elementary school in Towson. And the previous county executive, the powers that be, board members, whoever made those decisions could not come to a conclusion as to where in Towson to build an additional elementary school. So Stonely, Hampton, other overcrowded schools in the Towson area were given renovations. So even Stonely that got a renovation that expanded its capacity did not have their core space expanded. So they're in the exact same situation as Hampton except they're overcrowded. There was at that time also the same call that is being had now for Cromwell Valley to participate in the relief. And it was decided to put a walker zone there. And in order to facilitate that walker zone, Cromwell Valley Elementary was taken off the magnet program for three years because you cannot put a zone at a magnet school without first creating the space for the magnet program or for the zone kids to move into. So in order to create the space, 
no students except uh, siblings and walkers were allowed to enroll in that school for three years. I think it's worth noting that in that three years, Pleasant Plains became really overcrowded <laughs> because that meant kids who might have entered the lottery and gone to Cromwell then couldn't. And so 100 kids moved from Hampton to Cromwell. So Cromwell has participated in the overcrowding by moving 100 students from Hampton to Cromwell. That's why Hampton has any space at all right now. And the situation at Cromwell is that when you leave a school off the magnet program for a certain number of years, it takes a little bit of time to fill that school up, but also any time a boundary is changed, the fourth and fifth graders from the boundary change are allowed to stay at the previous school. So you have kids in the Walker zone for Cromwell who are still attending Hampton because they were in fourth and fifth grade and the fourth and fifth graders and their younger siblings are allowed to stay at the school even though the boundary was changed. So it takes time for a boundary to be fully implemented. Now, theoretically, somebody could say, let's make Cromwell Valley, just get rid of the magnet program, have a neighborhood school. But to do that, all of the magnet students who are lottery placements have to be allowed to stay there until their terminal grade and matriculate out of the school naturally according to our policy. So if someone wanted to go back and do this now, you would not be able to make it a neighborhood school for three to five more years, is that correct? That is correct. Okay, so even that is not a short-term solution. And how long, it was 2015 that we had the boundary study at Cromwell, right? So how long is it gonna be that that, um, we don't have much more, right, for the matriculation of the students from Hampton to fully be at Cromwell and for the magnet program to be full again. Based on the data we have, um, by the next school year, all of the grade levels will be, um, will be at, the school will be at capacity because the magnet program would have moved up um, along with the students as we have kindergarten students entering as well. Okay, so the other thing I'd like to point out is that there was a plan at a certain point in time to put an elementary school at the old Lock Raven Elementary site. And my understanding of that situation is that that Lock Raven Elementary site is owned by the county. It's owned by, it's run by county recs and parks. It is a rec council facility for the Lock Raven Recreation Council. It has senior services in there. It has three Head Start classrooms in there. It has an after school mentorship program for boys from Lock Raven Technical Academy in there and several other things that I'm sure I'm forgetting, but it's also the only green space for that entire area that's walkable from Hillendale all the way from the city line from Halstead all the way up that's available during school hours to the community because there are no parks in that area. And when the plan to make that an elementary school was being discussed and worked out, eventually the county executive decided not to do it because that school is a historic building and the community wanted to keep it a historic building, fought to keep it a historic building, and the cost of putting a school there with the historic building exceeded the value of the number of seats they would get from that when you included having to relocate the other services. So I just wanted to point all that out because this is something that these communities have already been through every time there's Towson overcrowding. Parkville <laughs> is told you can just, just do this, just put kids over here and over here in shopping mall plazas and vacancy in here. But the fact of the matter is, we're working on a 10 year long term plan. The county government is working on this. Eventually they'll bring the board into the process and hopefully we will have a solution that does not obliterate all the green space in Parkville, that does not have kids just debates about relocating kids from one overcrowded school to another overcrowded school and hopefully we'll be able to get the county, county council to make law changes that keep developers from developing further in overcrowded schools but 
I just, I hear different board members trying to assert these different things, but I've lived there for 15 years and we have had these debates ad nauseum. And I just wanted to clarify these things. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Kuhn, and then I have comments. Thanks. Um, so I have a few questions, and, and thank you, uh, Ms. Rowe, for sharing some of that history. Um, I myself lived through history when Rogers Forge was at 150%, and they built West, West Towson to the exact number, and now it's headed in the overcrowded area. So one of the concerns I have, and I asked last time we had this discussion, was what, what is the definition of short term? And there is no answer because once we make this change, the change is set until we can revisit it again, from my understanding. And so my follow-on question to that is, since we don't want to you know, throw kids all over the place all the time, what is the time frame that we lock something down before we, we'll reconsider like another boundary, um, unless we're gonna construct something new or something like that. Do we have a rule in place that says, so for instance, 2015 Cromwell went through their boundary study, and I was told that they're locked out, plus they've got the magnet thing at this point, so that's why they weren't included. Is there anything that would keep us from <coughs> not doing this again soon? One of the things that we always look at as a team um, in terms of beginning any boundary study is when the, a more recent or the l latest boundary study took place. And that's because we want to have minimal impact to kids in terms of moving them. So in, in response to your question, if this particular um, recommendation is voted on tonight, um, and it, is, it would go into effect the fall of 2020, we would ask the board to be considerate of the impact it would have on the same set of children that would be moving from Pleasant Plains also to Halstead because of the number of times they would be moved, the transition that's involved in that, the impact on families, but also on, on staff as well. So we would have to look at um, how recent was the most, the most recent move um, before we engage in that process again. We'd have to look at that. Right, so, so my question is exactly about that. When do we reconsider another change? Because everything's filling up here. Mm -hmm. I, I was looking, I have the numbers book here, right? I was literally going through it as we're talking. And Cromwell shows 80 some percent, and that's why people focus on it, right? right? Mm -hmm. And so my concern is, as the central area, and especially this area, gets saturated with elementary school children, which is kind of where we are, and there's a lot of building going on, um, what is our next step in trying to address it from your perspective? From my perspective, the best way to address the challenge of overcrowding, not just within the central area, but across BCPS, is really to look at a multi-year plan. A multi-year plan, as Ms. Pastor shared, that would look at really regional solutions to balance enrollment and to really um, reduce the number of overcrowding in a number of schools. Um, as the, the board is well aware, this provides a short-term solution for one school. And based on all the feedback we receive, it has an impact on another school. And so um, the best solution is really to look at a multi-year plan, which I know is part of the process that, is, that, it, that we're undergoing right now. And that will allow us, through working with consultants, to take a look at all of the schools, take a look at a number of factors, and then identify the best approach moving forward so that it isn't just one school, but we're looking at a cluster of schools, we're looking at a region of schools. That's the most... Um, I think fair and balanced way to approach the challenge. So that's great, and I know that the 10 year planning plan, whatever plan we're talking about, is supposed to be hopefully moving forward. I haven't heard enough about that, and I'm growing concerned, to be honest with you, mm -hmm. since it's not within the school system's purview and control. Mm -hmm. The county is, in essence, I guess, uh, in charge of that, and we're kind of working with them. Um, so I'm very concerned about that and the timing because mm -hmm. this is real impacts on children now. Mm -hmm. And planning for 10 years is great, but we have concerns now about the impacts. And that's why, I mean, Pleasant Plains, I mean, it's outrageous, the situation that they're in. And, and I agree with that. Um, and I support the fact that we need to do something now. My concern 
is that we, we're not really solving anything and we keep using terms like short term, but we all know this isn't short, short term. We're not gonna read, do anything with these children that we're affecting right now for the next three to five years, because if you're moving kindergartners through five grade, you know, grade five, you're trying not to impact them and their families for the foreseeable future, three to five years, right? So in essence, we're locking these things with all of this development coming on tap at the same time, which is extremely concerning. And I know that I brought up the Bicota Center previously because it was a school. I know it is now um, not being used as a school, but the facility's there. Um, and I don't believe we've had any discussions with the county about that property in particular. Now, it's not a magic bullet. It's not right next to Pleasant Plains, so it doesn't fix it perfectly, right, um, and yell out to everybody. But as, as we're sitting here and looking at solutions for this, and, and I know that, and I don't disagree, you guys all did a fine job with what you were handed. What, what my, my concern is, is the process itself and the limitations imposed on you all aren't, aren't getting you to where you need to be as a system. I'm like, it's, anyway, I, it's very concerning that we're getting to uh, kind of a weak compromise type of a solution. We're not addressing, um, uh, like Ms. Joe said, she said the, f the facilities that they just went to, Pleasant Plains and, um, and Hillendale, are old and, and in poor shape. So we're not even talking about improving those situations. We're literally just, you know, kind of relieving the steam that's blowing out of the, uh, the pot at this point in time so it doesn't explode. So I have concerns, and, I'm, and, and while... Um, I'm just extremely conflicted by this. I, I, gotta, I gotta be super honest about it. Um, uh, listening to Pleasant Plains, parents come, and, and I have a picture right in front of me of the hallway. I think of, uh, it's, it's, a, it's full and it's like half the school there. Not, not even the entire school in there yet. And I, and I understand uh, you know, these impacts are, are really midterm type of a change, right? When we say short term, I don't even know what that means. Nobody's been able to to even answer that for me. And I believe we shouldn't talk about short term because in my mind, short term is one to three years. Well, that's you know three grades for a kid, but then when you get somebody into a new school, you're gonna take them through five or six years there, kindergarten through fifth. So that's kind of midterm. I mean, an entire kindergarten existence is six years. It's not a short amount of time. And it's almost, it's a challenge to understand it in the terms that we're really living it. So um, I know that you were kind of handed a poor hand to play. I think you played it as well as you could. Um, I'm concerned that we didn't reach outside trying to get better cards uh, to, to, to improve it. Um, but I do commend the work that you've done. Um, I'm just, you know, I, I think I'm kind of echoing the frustration that I'm hearing. And, and as I sit here, I literally have the map of all the elementary schools in the Towson area up on my computer. That's why I keep looking at it and pointing. You know, not that I'm crazy, but um, there's a significant amount of elementary schools in a small area here. Um, and that's great. Unfortunately, they're all hitting capacity and going over capacity. So I'm very, I very much look forward to the 10 year plan, but I, 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 I believe short term needs to be, um, we need to throw the idea short term out because this is really a midterm, you know, uh, answer to what, what the problem currently is. Thank you. Time to the next. Ms. Han and then Ms. Han and then Ms. Causey. <laughs> Thank you. So I want to begin by, by saying how highly I believe in this process, how strongly I believe in it, and what great work everyone has done that has contributed to the boundary study process, not only Pleasant Plains, but I believe strongly in this and the efficacy of it. I think it's a solid process. Um, the beauty of it is that it is so focused, but I think that's a double-edged sword in that it is so focused because there's so much work 
that needs to be done, right? You've accomplished what you set out to do, which is to provide short-term relief for Pleasant Plains, and you've done that. You've given us option B, which provides short-term relief, but as you've heard tonight, there's more work to be done. So even though we'll make a decision tonight, the work doesn't stop to, you know, here. It continues tomorrow with the need to pursue a long-term option. Um, continued, you've heard that I think from every board member who has spoken tonight, the need to find more seats, more relief for not only the central area, but countywide, as Ms. Pasteur said. We need to do better. We need, um, as you said, um, Dr. Wheatley Phillip, we need um, systematic plans. We need to look more broadly. We need to look at regional long-term planning. Um, that's what I shared with in my remarks at Pleasant Plains last night. I said, by no means does the work stop after the decision tonight. So I applaud the work that's been done. You set out to do what you, you needed to do. At the same time, uh, the job's not done. So thank you very much for all the work that's gone into this. I know it wasn't easy. I really appreciate the work of the committee members. Um, it's a huge time commitment and you know, certainly a huge t time commitment on behalf of staff. So I really appreciate all the efforts and all the, res the responsiveness to the community, to board members' requests. Um, that's no small task. So I really do appreciate it. And thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm not gonna take a lot of time, but I do wanna just reiterate my personal thanks to the central office staff for all of the hard work that you've done. I also thank all of my board members who have engaged in this process. As you heard, school visits, uh, attending the public hearing, reading the remarks from the public hearing, all the emails and so forth. I also wanna commend the community, those members that have come forward concerned about children, and that is the focus. The focus is how can we improve outcomes and opportunity for all of our children. And this is a very difficult process. It's difficult for everyone. And I just want to acknowledge that we understand that. And as a board, we are here to make those decisions that are best for the children in the school system. And I say all these things, and I am cognizant of the fact that Hampton Elementary School was built in 1954 with a state-rated capacity of 307 children. And the 2012 $19 million addition did not add space to the gymnasium nor the cafeteria. The capacity for Hampton Elementary School today is over 660 students with a gymnasium and a cafeteria built for 307. Moving forward with new students attending Hampton Elementary School, that school must be included in any long-term construction plans to address inadequate facilities of its gymnasium and cafeteria for its current student enrollment. Hampton Elementary at one point reached 180% capacity it just in the last decade with 11 trailers and three grades outside of its school building for years. We cannot continue in this manner we cannot continue it for Hampton Elementary School, and we cannot continue it for Pleasant Plains Elementary School. We need to consider the real numbers produced by development in downtown Towson or anywhere else throughout the county that continue to overcrowd our schools. We need to examine the planning formula that says with cranes all over downtown Towson and thousands of planned housing units, Hampton Element Elementary School will only have a projected additional 25 students. The community has seen changing projections and we've heard how weary they are of the current ones. So with that, I'm gonna ask Dr. Williams to evaluate short-term support to Hampton Elementary School, it, uh, not only with the current projections of students coming, because as a parent mentioned at the board hearing at Lock Raven High School, a parent from Hampton Elementary School was saying how unfortunate is it going to be for students moving from Pleasant Plains Elementary School starting lunch at 1030 to come to Hampton Elementary School and experience the same overcrowding? So we need support, and I would just ask Dr. Williams to evaluate that short-term support to Hampton Elementary School, and I agree with Ms. Joes that Pleasant Plains Elementary School needs their uh, additional support um, in terms of staffing and other resources to be evaluated because we want our children to succeed. And as everyone has said, these are short-term plans, and, and the community is asking where is the long-term plan? And this board, some board members have been 
talking since 2015 about a 10-year school construction plan. And we were, uh, I was very proud last year when this board voted to approve uh, in the operating budget starting that 10-year construction plan. The county executive agreed with the board, uh, but he put the funding in the county government's budget, and so they have been working on the process. So I want to just alert everyone to go back to board docs, and there is an information item. It's under O, information item O, and it's this is just released today, the multi-year improvement plan for all schools, and it discusses where we are, Baltimore County government and Baltimore County public schools, collaborating to hire a consultant to assist in the development of the long-range plan for identifying and prioritizing capital improvements to schools. The plan will model Anne Arundel County's plan and will develop Baltimore County public schools' capital needs based on the following three pillars, enrollment projections, capacity, utilization assessment, educational equity and adequacy assessment, facilities condition assessment. The Anne Arundel plan, just to uh, point out to folks, they did a 10-year plan, it was highly successful, and they are now in their second 10-year plan for uh, capital construction. And it, this is district-wide, this is not just which communities are saying they're overcrowded. It's a systemic evaluation. So I am proud of this board that voted for it. I'm pleased that the county executive and the county government are proceeding on with it. There's also in here the project phasing that talks about the high school's master's plan with a projected September 2020 completion date and phasing phase two, which would be remaining schools, centers, and programs for a May 2021 uh, completion date. The recommendations from the high school master plan would be uh, presented in the fiscal year 22 capital budget and CIP, and then the recommendations for the elementary uh, schools, the other centers, and other programs would bring recommendations to the fiscal year 23 capital budget plan. And the last thing I'm going to say is that, as um, was pointed out by one of our public speakers and by numerous times, is the board can identify our needs and we can uh, request for our needs, but we are um, not our own funding authority. So we do have to go and uh, request funding from our local and our state partners, and we have been encouraged by their participation, but we need to continue to advocate for the needs of children. So again, I just want to thank everyone. Ms. Pasture. I'm going to direct this, um, please, to um, Dr. Williams, because none of this was on your watch. You walked into this. And so thank you for soldiering. I'm sure I just made that up. Um, up to this. And again, thank you. Um, I looked out at some of the staff, and I know which ones of you have been around for a very, very long time. So I, can, I just want to go back to what Ms. Joe said. I know you have to look at the budget, um, but I looked at um, uh, your budget, and throughout, you are very clear about what you want in terms of, of improvements in our schools. And not just professional development, but thinking outside of the box. So I see it won't help with this decision necessarily, but this is an opportunity. You remember when we call those those teachable moments? Um, and this is one to say, now is the time to change our paradigm and to really, as, as you have said, Dr. Um, Wheatley Phillip, that we're going to look at that regional, we look at the big picture. But we have been saying for many years, old, all of you old timers, and I'm going to um, speak to one, those of us who were in struggling schools, that when we did staffing, we did not do the staffing by the numbers. Is that correct? We were supposed to be doing staffing by the needs. And I know, because I know your spirit and your direction, that you will give that consideration to Pleasant Plains so they won't lose that, and to the other schools as well. I can also, again, as I pointed out before, been, having been in magnet schools and part of starting magnet schools, that 
we can reach, as Ms. Max said, oversaturation sometimes because when I look at what is happening at Cromwell for the magnet program, it is wonderful. However, I want, it says, um, to empower learners, uh, to make them responsible and productive digital citizens, knowledge of construction, designers, innovative, and it goes on and on, computational thinkers. And I want to know which one of those characteristics do we not want in the 21st century for all of our children, whether they're in a magnet school or a comp regular comprehensive school. And I know from your budget, remember I said to you, if you wrote it, you said it, I know it, okay, that that's where we are now, that we should be doing all of those things for all of our children all of the time. So I look forward to us moving in that direction. And it um, is nice to hear about those who know the history of all of this since 2015. I'm going to take you to 1988, OK? 1988, because when that gentleman, Mr. Barksdale, came up, who I haven't seen in over 27 years since we did the UDAT project, I can truly say that I was the chair of the urban design for the west side, the northwest side, when they were fighting about Randallstown and what we went through to get that because it is a historical school. And I'm looking at the schools in the second and the fourth districts, and we're still waiting in many cases. Thank you, Mr. Dixon, for working through it for Summit Park. That is 134 percent um, overcrowded. And when Mr. Kuhn asks, says, look at the page, I don't need to look at the page because I've re memorized those numbers. So this is our teachable moment with them so that we change how we are doing what we do. So that anybody who's speaking about five years of working on this, let's take all the way back to 1988, another century, where we have been looking at this and people before you have not really fully looked at it because I have the book at home since I was the chair of UDAT that talks about what it was going to look like in terms of staffing in the 21st century. And those chickens, all of them, have come home to roost. And we don't have 10 more years to be processing that. So my hope is not only will they get materials, but that whatever happens to Pleasant Plains, Cromwell, Hampton, all of those schools that we, this won't be the end. This is not whatever the vote is, the discussion doesn't stop here. That we say, okay, now, how do we use this and change this paradigm? Because I'm feel. Board members, any other questions or comments? We have a motion and a second to Um, I'll just reread the motion to approve the recommended capacity relief option B for Pleasant Plains Elementary School. All in favor, please raise your hand. <coughs> Any opposed? Any abstained? The motion carries. Thank you very much for all of your work. Thank you. Earlier in the evening, uh, per policy 8314, we added uh, board member comments, and there was a comment that they would be brief because we are uh, working towards a goal. Dr. Williams and uh, board officers have set, so um, we want to be mindful of staff's time. So I will uh, start with Ms. Rowe, and we'll just go right around. So in order to be mindful of staff time, I have no comments. Thank you. I have dedicated time in February and March to visit District 1 schools. Um, to date, I have visited 14 schools, and I have 10 visits scheduled this week. Um, there are many very good things happening in our schools, but the one thing that I continue to be so impressed by is that our principals seem to know the names of every student in their school. And I'm talking about schools where there's 700 kids. I'm not really sure how they do it. It has to be like a principal superpower. Um, but not only do they know the kids' names, 
I saw a principal say to a young lady, hey, how's your mom doing? And it just is mind boggling to me. Um, during a visit to a District 1 middle school, I was able to see small groups of musicians practicing in hallways, stairwells, and classrooms. Initially, I have to say that they did not sound like they were practicing the same song. Then I attended the Southwest Area Band Concert where it all came together quite amazingly. Congratulations to all musicians and music teachers who participated in the concert. And I'd also like to thank all, all of the principals who have taken the time to meet with me this month and last month. Thank you. I was gonna pass, but I've gotta say this. I've attended plays at Patapsco twice, Dundalk, Kenwood, General John Stricker. If you're into plays, if, if you can't, you don't have the money to attend, you know, the Lyric or the Morris Mechanic or someplace, seriously look at our high schools and our middle schools and our elementary schools and see what plays that they're offering because this can really be an experience for you. Uh, Friday night I went to Patapsco and saw Matilda. There, there had to be 40, 50, 60 kids involved in that, and that's the ones that you can see out front. It's not the ones behind the curtains. So take advantage of, of what we have out there with our plays. Uh, thank you. Ms. Joes. Thank you. Um, this past weekend, the Maryland Association of Student Councils invited me, along with other women leaders, to participate in the Women Leadership Forum, and I want to thank everyone in the MASC. Uh, we had some great discussions on overcoming obstacles and raising the ceiling and being equitable. Nehru said, evil unchecked grows. Evil tolerated poisons the system. The past couple of weeks, the women of color on this board have been unduly attacked viciously on social media. And I want to address this because children are watching. There's an urgency to this because we are failing our children. And our focus should be to let our superintendent and BCPS school leader do his job. He is a leader. He leads the system. Don't obstruct him. Support is not just lip service but actively supporting our superintendent because his success is tied to the success of our children. Therefore, it is critical that the board members take the lead in setting a positive, kind, and affirmative tone. We are made kind by being kind. The Gita says, lead us from darkness to light. Lead us from ignorance to knowledge and education. Thank you. Thank you. I'll be going last. Ms. Hen? Thank you. So I would second Mr. McMillian's comments about our amazing arts programs, including our theater program. I would attend all of our productions if I could in my, my spare time. Um, I attended Perry Hall High School's production of Bye Bye Birdie, and it was phenomenal. Um, I also had the pleasure of um, attending Delaney High School's um, physics, I'm going to get this wrong, physics, Olympiad, and Chemathon, and that was a fantastic event with our science teachers. Um, quite enjoyable. I wanted to almost be back in high school to be a participant because it was so much fun. Um, so it was a, a great couple of weeks in BCPS. So thank you, everyone, and thank you to central staff for your continued support of the board. Appreciate it. Have a good evening. Mr. Rashid? Mr. Offerman? Uh, just to comment that uh, a recent visit to Everly High School, uh, I want to thank Ms. Uh, Ms. Sample, principal, for the great job that she's doing there and the creative ways that they're addressing problems with students with discipline concerns and students who need credit uh, work in, in, in order to, uh, to uh, uh, graduate on time. She, uh, they're doing a fine job there. Ms. Pastor. I want to thank the staff for everything that you do and all of you who come out to support the staff and the board. Thank you, Dr. Williams. Um, I want to thank you for just jumping in and all that you are doing. And from the moment we met you during the process to this moment as I speak, I have never seen you as an empty suit, an empty chair. You are the real deal. Thank you. And I don't care what Fox Sports is. 
Mr. Kuhn. Okay, I'll, I'll be brief. Um, I just want to, uh, you know, wish everybody a happy spring forward, and I hope that uh, it's easier to wake up tomorrow on time, uh, and just hope everyone uh, can stay calm and wash your hands. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. So we appreciate all of the work of everyone and I just want to remind people that Dr. Williams has been here just a few short months and has made tremendous, uh, tremendous improvements to the school system. And this board, uh, I think, feels collectively that all of the effort that we went to to process that superintendent search, as Ms. Pesture said, has been 100% worth it. So we thank you for all that you're doing. And uh, we just need to understand that this is a very large school system, and there's a lot that's going on, and Dr. Williams is putting his arms around it all, and we're gonna be working together to support him and to support the school system, because his success is the success of all of our children. Um, I also wanted to point out, since I had the extra minute, that uh, it was nice to celebrate with Dr. Williams the National Board Certified Teachers um, that we have in Baltimore County Public Schools, and also the aspiring uh, teachers that are working in the cohorts to achieve that in the future. And I appreciate Dr. Williams having a special celebration for them for that. And also, I do just want to encourage all of our students to get engaged and get on the website and look at our student member of the boards. Uh, candidates that are out there, they have videos and answers to student questions. And then get engaged and use your power and vote. With that, the last item is item O. As I mentioned, information, the 10-year capital plan is now, information is attached to board docs. The next thing is announcements. The next board meeting is Tuesday, March 24th, 2020 at 6.30 p.m. May everyone be safe. Take care.